welcome everyone. This is the first episode of the Floating Offshore Wind mini-series. This is a joint effort by different trade, uh, trade offices and projects in Taiwan. And the mini-series comes in three videos, each ad addressing different uh, elements to realize and, or accelerate floating offshore wind for Taiwan. We will discuss different topics, uh, such as how the industry chain in Taiwan may benefit from floating offshore wind, how can it be realized and what steps should be taken um, in order to, uh, to get floating wind in Taiwan. Our session today uh, is to address the importance of offshore wind and why the need for floating winds. My name is Anouk van der Steen. I am, the Netherlands, I am working for the Netherlands Office Taipei as Councillor for Innovation, Technology and Science. Uh, as Netherlands Office Taipei, we actually have a strong focus on offshore wind. Since 2015, we have a MOU uh, with the Bureau of Energy in Taiwan. Uh, there are 40 companies or more than 40 companies, Dutch companies active in Taiwan for offshore wind. And I think it's good to mention that also related to floating wind specifically, uh, there is a big push uh, from, from the Netherlands. Uh, on the 3rd of December, we organized the Dutch and Taiwan expertise and supply chain on floating winds. And I am happy to further discuss this topic with uh, some experts here today. We have four experts uh, for this first episode on the buzz of offshore wind and why floating winds. And I wish to invite them all to shortly introduce themselves and give uh, in, in short, what they believe is the most important message of today. Can I start with my uh, first guest, Reggie? Yes, yes thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Reggie Wu, and I have an electrical engineering background, as well as uh, doing trade and investment for, for more than 20 years with the Scottish government. Uh, the, the reason why we're here is actually to talk about the offshore wind uh, investment, particularly for floating offshore wind. And uh, the important thing about today's uh, venue is really not only to discuss about the technology, but also to discuss about how we interact with the local environment, primarily the supply chain. So that is the one thing that uh, we particularly emphasize on this uh, venture in Taiwan, is that we have to build that local supply chain and then to be able to not only use it in Taiwan, but also to export this capability outside of Taiwan. Thanks. Thank you, Reggie. It's Marina, also a short introduction and your main message. Yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Marina Su. I'm the Managing Director of Copenhagen Infrastructure Wind Power here in Taiwan. We are currently constructing two offshore wind farms outside of Zhanghua County in Taiwan, our Zhangfang Xidao project and our Zhongnan project, which is a joint venture with the local state-owned company, China Steel. Together with these two wind farms, we are able to power and provide one million household clean energy. And uh, not just with these fixed bottom solutions, for floating solutions, we are very actively deploying and, and uh, investing into projects outside of Scotland, uh, outside of Italy, from France to Greece to uh, outside of California, and also nearby countries to Taiwan, Korea, Vietnam and Japan are all the places where we are actively involved in floating wind. So today we're very happy to share some of our experiences. Thank you. Great, great to have you here. Elvin, please, uh, from your side. Thank you, Anu. Um, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Elvin. So I'm the country manager for Piscalus mm -hmm. Taiwan, and also the regional manager looking after APEC uh, here for Piscalus. So Piscalus is a Dutch company looking after uh, marine and dredging. So basically, our work uh, inclusive of uh, includes uh, cable installation, foundation installation, and also turbine installation. So uh, for us uh, here in, uh, in Taiwan, we have been active in the, almost all of the wind farm here in Taiwan, and uh, very lucky we also support CIP uh, for the Shanghai Sida project, and also for Kingdai project in Scotland, we also support foundation energy. So I'm very glad and honored to be here in Taiwan, uh, to be here to to be able to uh, let everyone know more about. Uh, Buscarless and also our ambition and also our interest in floating offshore. Yeah, we look forward to hear everything from you as well. Homa, please. Yeah, my name is Homa Wu. Uh, I'm a journalist. I'm a staff writer from Business Weekly, uh, Shangye Zhoukan. Um, Business Weekly is the most read uh, 
business magazine in Taiwan and also a well-known digital media in Taiwan. I hope the Chinese speaking uh, readers here, we all, all know about us. Okay, I think as a media, uh, we are very sensitive about what the readers want to know. And we're responsible to provide them the most updated and the objective information that they need. So I think for decarbonization and also green energy are very key words for the next year to come, I think. Uh, so we want to provide as many, as much information as possible, especially about offshore wind as one of the um, very promising options as uh, green energy in Taiwan. Great, thank you, uh, Homa. Okay. Let me uh, start with asking you the first uh, okay. question. Yeah, because uh, maybe it's a basic question. Mm -hmm. Does Taiwan need offshore winds? Yeah. Okay. I think uh, not only the people here. I think we all believe that it's definitely a yes. Uh, first of all, in the turn of demands, uh, we all know that uh, the Taiwan needs electricity, especially in renewable energies, especially when the government have a goal ending for to increase the renewable energy percentage to 20 percent by the year of 2025 but now the percentage is about five percent um, so you see we only have three years left and also we have very insufficient supply of green energies for example uh, so far we have uh, the, uh, the renewable certificate uh, Ninety-nine percent of these certificates are purchased by one single company, which is TSMC. you know TSMC. <laughs> yes, so there is very clear um, sign that we don't have enough green energy. So of course, an offshore wind is the very promising supply, and then we really want it, and we really need it. And second of all is that uh, the government also wanted the offshore wind to become the next. Uh, domestic industry. Uh, we want it to be worth maybe one trillion uh, NT dollars. So it's really huge and it might be a promising industry for uh, all the supply chains that we have uh, other choices. So I think uh, in many different aspects that we really do need this kind of new energy source. Yeah, thanks. Yes. Marina, do you, do you have anything to, to add to, to this question if Taiwan needs uh, offshore wind energy? Taiwan is heavily, heavily depending on fossil fuel. Heavily, heavily depending on our more than 90% of our energy sources are imported. Mm -hmm. You know, they, therefore we do not have energy security, we do not have energy independence, and uh, relying on renewable energy, in particular offshore wind, will create our energy independence, will create that energy security this Taiwan is, is, is in dire need of. And uh, we all know that the Taiwanese government has now announced uh, a pretty, I would say very optimistic, 2050 net zero goal. And offshore wind is the solution that will help Taiwan quickly attain that goal because of our relatively large install capacity, relatively high capacity factor. So it's a really effective and efficient tool to support Taiwan reaching that net zero goal that uh, that we are also hoping for and also providing more security for the people in this island. Yeah, great. Thank you. We actually also asked the expert uh, from abroad, from Denmark, Kim Schultz, to uh, uh, share a little bit on this, uh, specifically uh, via video. Yeah, hello everybody. So um, reflecting on the topic discussed today and in the studio, the development or generation of power through floating offshore wind is of course uh, very essential for, for many reasons. However, however, can we always fully utilize all those energy uh, sources timelessly generated only by floating offshore wind? Uh, and uh, how can we remedy uh, this? Uh, so. We have seen in Europe that power to X, meaning the production of green fuels uh, based on green power, is the solution, uh, especially when we are not able to replace fossil fuels directly with the renewable power. 
actually, we need to make use of renewable power everywhere uh, where we can. But we also have to realize that we cannot use renewable power directly for all purposes. Uh, or we cannot always use uh, renewable power from batteries uh, uh, for all the very different types of energy consumption that we do have. So uh, power tracks based on uh, uh, renewable power uh, and uh, doing production of uh, green fuels um, is very important. And uh, what is happening is that we actually split water into hydrogen and oxygen by means of electrolyzers. And uh, those electrolyzers naturally have to be powered by renewable power. So the green hydrogen that we derive from that process um, is possible to use directly as a fuel for many purposes, including industrial uh, high temperature processing, and uh, especially that's feasible if you have uh, established a hydrogen uh, pipeline network, which is uh, planned in Europe. And if you combine the green hydrogen uh, with the nitrogen that you pull out of the air, you can generate the green ammonia, uh, which you can use, of course, as a sustainable fertilizer for the agricultural sector but also as a green fuel for cargo vessels. Uh, so that's being planned by, by many shipping companies. And um, if you combine the, the green hydrogen with the carbon dioxide, you can also generate what we call e-fuels. So that's uh, fuels like methanol, or it could be a jet fuel. And the methanol you can use for combustion engines, so in, in cars and trucks and buses, and uh, the jet fuel, of course, for airplanes. So that's a, a very important uh, manner of solving the carbon emission issues. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a pity you couldn't join us here, but uh, we will continue with the talk uh, in the studio. Um, there is a clear need for green energy, um, but what are the main challenges? That would, that would be my next question. Homao, uh, can I ask you first? To, uh, yeah, from please. our observation, the main challenges and barriers come from at least three aspects. And the first one and probably most important one is the barrier from the local supply chain. Because the wind industry is relative, you know, we are the newcomers. So you can see that we lack of technology. We lack of experience. We don't have enough professional work power, uh, workforce. Uh, that would be the three most important thing. For example, the, the, although the biggest uh, steel maker in Taiwan, the China Steel, is trying to make everything, uh, the equipment, the parts locally, but there's a lot to catch up. That's in terms of technology and also in the experience that we have to catch up with the international standards. And the third part is about the workforce. For example, the pandemic has keep a lot of foreign experts away from us. So I, as, I, as far as I know that some construction has been delayed this year because the foreign uh, experts could not come into our island. So these are the uh, barriers from the, the, this local supply chain. And also we don't have enough uh, study of the environment. Uh, that is prob quite discussed before that uh, because we are not looking for a short term study, but a long term survey of the climate and the environment that infected um, to collect all these objective data so you can communicate and uh, persuade people to that uh, people uh, involved to understand the importance and the benefits uh, of uh, wind power, not just looking at the disadvantage or, or an active size. I think that is the way in, only when we have enough data, when we, only when we have study enough, then we can uh, make the communication more through, more thorough uh, to that the people know about the pros and cons so they can decide what they really want. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Maybe, uh, thank Reggie, you. can I ask you to uh, also give your view on the main challenges related to offshore wind power? Yes, yes, of course. I think that uh, when Flotation Energy started uh, doing business in Taiwan, uh, it's almost two years, we have been uh, exposed to the major 
issues, particularly with floating wind. And this has to do with uh, permits and also uh, legislation. Okay, so the reason why we need to do is to get Coleman to streamline these uh, policies. That that's the only way to get give investor confidence in the market, because no uh, no company would put money in unless there is a government policy that directs what's going to happen mm. in this particular market. If that happens, then it will enable the uh, Taiwan to be able to create uh, many things. Firstly, is that now you can go into deeper water. That would free, uh, free away most of those uh, on near shore mm. location and allows you more places to go and build this wind farm. And it's also easier to decommission. You don't have to take away the fixed structure. You merely remove the harness and tow it back. And as simple as that. So uh, the key issue is really actually to enable the government enabling these policies to make the system work. And then the companies will automatically come and direct this out. What will happen would be that it will bring all of this after, let's say, 20, 25 years, we can return all of this back to nature. Great. Uh, you already indeed uh, make the switch to uh, to floating winds, and I'm happy about that. Uh, and you mentioned enabler. Um, I think in the world, uh, like floating wind is really seen as an enabler uh, for deep water offshore wind projects uh, and wind energy production. Um, let's let's move indeed into floating winds as uh, indeed the topic of today. Uh, first question: Why is it important to talk about floating wind, and why is it important to talk about floating winds in Taiwan and here? Maybe Elvin, uh, can I? Uh, can I ask you first? Of course. So it's very interesting because I started uh, looking at Taiwanese offshore wind in 2015. And uh, back then, there were very, very few players, um, local players like CSC, CSBC, having the M team and the wind team. And then, uh, of course, we have the local uh, developers like Swancore, PGC, and also foreign developers like Earthstats and CIP. And uh, that's very predominantly focusing on fixed bottom. But as you can see from the auction, uh, upcoming auction, the, there's very limited uh, sites in Taiwan there where it's uh, below 50, 55 meters. So it naturally has to go to floating. Um, and uh, going forward with the whole whole floating wind uh, technology, it's an emerging technology. So there's a lot of uh, new uh, uh, technology and, uh, and, and we need to get the investors and the bankers, as what uh, Rigi said as well, confident, right? Before they have the confidence, we need to assure that uh, there's enough uh, uh, ability for local supply chain. There's an ability to, uh, to to have the right policy to so that the uh, floating wind is able to be carried out. And uh, and yeah, if if we don't have this, then uh, it's difficult for floating to carry on going forward. Yeah, Reggie, do you have anything to to add here? Uh, also. Yes, just to add on what Elvin has said, yeah. is that uh, we did sign an MOU with CSPC. And the main reason is not just to find a partner who could build something for us, but actually to work together to, to build and open up this totally new supply chain that would not only serve Taiwan's interests, but also to be able to export all of this supply chain material mm. to more countries in Asia. And that would be something really ad advantageous, not only for for developers, but also for Taiwan as a whole. Taiwan will become the first international supply chain mm -hmm. for the region. So this is not only an enabling technology, but it's also a vision that uh, we could do because soon then uh, we could be able to nurture the next move in floating wind technology. Yeah, wow. Well. Sounds, uh, sounds good. Maybe, maybe related to this, it would be interesting to also hear a little bit of your experiences uh, related to, uh, to floating wind projects uh, and share with us your involvement uh, in the progress and, and the development, how it's going. Maybe Marina, can I, can I ask you to? Yes. 
Yes, to share business. Yeah, in CIP, we're always enthusiastic to pioneer new technology. So, in terms of offshore wind, we're very happy to share that uh, in Scotland we have opened this offshore wind floating offshore wind excellence center in Scotland in Edinburgh, and there we are able to utilize the oil and gas experience when it comes to production and also the understanding of the uh, the sea and uh, all the production flow. The technology and put it into a pilot project called Pentland pilot project, mm -hmm. which uh, next year will reach financial close. And then in 2023, the first floating turbine will be installed. And then we will follow up immediately with a pilot project of 100 megawatt, also outside of uh, Scotland. And that uh, 100 megawatt pilot Pentland project is uh, to be installed before 2025. So this is uh, something concrete in Scotland. But if we look elsewhere, if we look elsewhere, if we look back into uh, Taiwan, here in Taiwan, we have planned outside of Xinzhu and outside of Miaoli County, a total of 3.3 gigawatt, 3.3 gigawatt of floating offshore wow. wind potential. So that is something phenomenal. And uh, looking into Korea, actually Korea is quite ahead of Taiwan when it comes to uh, floating offshore wind. Uh, our projects in Korea soonest, so we could see our first demo floating projects in less than two years time in Korea. So that is something uh, I would say way ahead of Taiwan. And uh, not to mention uh, what I shared in the very beginning outside of the coast of California, uh, outside of the coast of Italy and France and Greece, we're all looking into floating possibilities. Wow, oh, great, great. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Maybe Alvin uh, from Pascalis. Uh, yes. So for Pascalis, uh, we're very much involved in the first few development for floating offshore wind in the world. So for example, if you talk about the first one, Green Float Atlantic, and also the second one, the High Wind Scotland, we are both involved as a TNI contractor of for the floaters. And also for the recently completed, constructed uh, Kinkadine offshore wind, uh, floating wind farm, we are also the full TNI contractor. So what our role includes the uh, dry transport of the floater from Spain to the Netherlands, integrating the turbine onto the, onto the floater, towing the, the full integrated structure from the Netherlands to Scotland, and uh, primo the uh, drag anchors, and then later on hook up to the, uh, the main integrated platform. So, so as you can see, um, there's, there's a lot of experience and a lot of times uh, you need um, experienced contractors like us to be able to uh, handle offshore challenges like this. And uh, one thing to point out uh, as well, I can, based on what we see for high winds uh, from uh, Windfield Atlantic and Kinkadin, even though they are using both the same principal power floater, but we can see that there's already a decrease from the, uh, the weight of the floater from um, from there to Kinkadine, a drop in 20% in terms of, uh, in terms of the uh, weight and dimension of the floater. So sooner but surely, the, uh, the, 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 there will be cost optimization, there will be uh, technology improvement and floating wind will, will, will override and, and will uh, get very close to the fixed bottom uh, technology. Yeah. So, Yes. Maybe a, a very good visual display is that the audience could see at our background. This is a good a visual presentation of what CIP will be launching in Pentland outside of Scotland. That's the, the floating solution that uh, people then can visualize. Yes. Yeah. We're sort of <laughs> floating on top. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Reggie, uh, from your uh, company, the, the experiences here in Taiwan, uh, like what, uh, what you're working on. Uh, well, I would like to take on what uh, Kelvin and Marina had said about sure. the King Cardin operation because that was what we created, a 50 megawatt uh, wind farm. Uh, simply said, we should not compare apples with apples when we're talking about fixed mm. fix foundation because they're just not the same. When you're talking about uh, submersible, that's what the found floating foundation is. Mm. Uh, and it's it's able to solve a lot of problems that fixed foundation couldn't, like uh, balancing the turbines in storm or, or or typhoon or hurricane. The buoyancy system actually balances the the foundation, mm. and so the turbine itself is mitigated with all of this uh, what's happening around. 
So that, that's totally different. So you have to compare apples with apples, not with other stuff. And the best thing is that uh, this technology makes it so simple that it's only a mooring system that you have to worry about. And the mooring system is, is just something to hook it on. So when you are ma doing major repair, you simply just tow it back to inland. And when you're decommissioning it, you just cut off the mooring line and then just take it back. Mm. As simple as that. And so that's what I'd like, like to add to the okay. advantage yeah. of this. Yeah, and maybe here, because Elvin, you also mentioned something like it's important to have a track record in this field. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this. Uh, how you feel uh, your expertise in this field is necessary once we go further with floating around the world. Sure. So as mentioned previously, floating winds are emerging technology. So as a developer or a contractor, we need to convince our, our lenders, our banks, why floating wind is the next going forward. Right, because uh, we need to make sure that uh, the, the, the the investment is uh, easily bankable, easily insurable, and uh, there's very least in terms of construction. And uh, right now we see in, in de delays in uh, in uh, Taiwanese offshore wind farm construction. But uh, going forward, how can we convince the bankers that the same will not happen for floating? Mm -hmm. It's even more offshore. It's even deeper waters. So so you need track records to prove to. Uh, uh, to the bankers that this is the way to go and also proven technologies uh, and also people who is able to who had did it before and uh, and and then the the expertise that they they bring from uh, this demonstration from if we can bring it to Taiwan uh, that will that will uh, definitely help uh, the, the regional investors to have more confidence and commitment towards the next frontier of offshore wind yeah great how about do you do you have any uh... Yeah, I think as journalists, of course, we like to everything to be record, so we have evidence to examine and can uh, evaluate more objectively the, the effect, especially the long-term effect. And people say that they said that you cannot manage something that you cannot measure, right? So in order to manage, you need to all these data are very important for us, and uh, and to keep a. Uh, the data as transparent as possible so people can get to know it better. I think it's also very important. And take the uh, Dutch government, for example, that because the, the wind records are actually managed by each different company, so the go Dutch government take over to integrate all this data together. I think that's a really great example for keeping records and uh, make it uh, researchable. Uh, we can make research, can survey it more thoroughly, so everybody can know the cost and uh, the pros and cons of the situation. Yeah, yeah, maybe it relates also to not reinventing the wheel constantly, but indeed use the expertise that is available and and the knowledge, uh, the technology that is available, and indeed being uh, put in different places around the world. So, uh, thank you. Maybe uh, looking into uh, Taiwan again. Um, what what are, you, are in your fields or your ideas of the the main recommendations for Taiwan mm -hmm. the, to develop floating winds? Mm -hmm. How can they how can they start here, mm -hmm. Marina? So. I would very much like to echo uh, Nung and Hua, uh, what uh, Her Ma has just shared, that we should not reinvent the wheels. We should really learn from the best practices from, uh, although other European countries and maybe nearby uh, Asian countries are just starting, but we should really start to grab their experience and well, integrate them with ours, our challenges and our experiences. And, and what we are advocating is if we look into, uh, for example, CIP's floating pipeline, uh, as I shared, we have planned up to 3.3 gigawatt of floating pipeline outside of uh, Xinzhu and Miaoli. And what is really needed for Taiwan right now is a more robust regulatory regime that could support the uh, the launch of such new technology and that regime should also take into consideration the uh, supply chain readiness and also the um, possibility to encompass scientific research like Herma was saying incorporate more research and uh, to really then apply into uh, to make it into life and uh, also uh, the regulatory regime should also take into consideration the financial feasibility of such investment because uh, like 
Elvin had、uh, shared earlier. It's the bankability that counts. It's the workability. It's the insurability that counts. So, so、uh, it really calls for a more thought through、uh, mechanism and、uh, again regulatory framework that would in- enable all of this. And、uh, of course, on top of that, we need.、Uh, More research opportunity to understand floating winds' impact to the environment. It should be positive impact, but if there are potential negative impact, what are there? What are the learnings from other countries? What we could improve for Taiwan, etc. and etc. So, it is quite a lot of work, but we believe that a、uh, a robust public-private partnership. Between the government, the private sector, the foreign government, and the academia, could enable this to happen. I can add as well. <coughs> I echo what Marina said: don't reinvent the wheel. For example, if you look at the fixed bottom in Europe,、um, the whole supply chain involved people that、like、I just mentioned: the floater comes from Spain, the turbine comes from Denmark, the integration, the logistics comes from the Netherlands. So we. Taiwan does not necessarily need to reinvent everything, right? They can tap onto the the, the best, latest technology. They can、uh, they can use、uh, what each country side.、Like, for example, the surrounding countries like Korea and Japan,、uh, there must be expertise from each country. And if all the countries work together、uh, in terms of R and D, they can work in terms of R and D. And again, this will create visibility in terms of the financing、uh, community and also、uh, supply chain. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, if that will actually accelerate the whole floating wind、uh, development, not just in Taiwan but in the region, and、uh, I think overall, the better the region, the better for Taiwan.、Mm. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, that's it's interesting. We we actually also asked this question uh, uh, to uh, Kim Shul, so we saw him earlier.、Uh, we will ask、uh, him again to、uh, give a little bit of in- insight on Power to X. Um, concerning the concept of、uh, power to X,、uh, this has been very well received in、uh, most of Europe. And now that we are moving quickly towards floating offshore wind for Taiwan,、uh, this may be significant for for the local industry,、uh, as it may create new business opportunities. So、um, there are some interesting examples of the benefit of、uh, adapting power to X. Uh, so one of the issues is that、uh, batteries for、uh, for transportation is、uh, they are actually too heavy and、uh, too large to be used for long distance、uh, transport, being airplanes or vessels or trucks. So we do need the green fuels for those types of transportation. Transportation. And also high temperature industrial processing, like melting of steel and uh, uh, making cement, is、uh, also very difficult to electrify. So there, you also need、uh, the green fuels.、Uh, green hydrogen and the other types of green fuels derived from、uh, green hydrogen are required for、uh, that type of processing. Uh, in order to reduce the carbon emissions for from、uh, various types of industries, and the whole chemical industry is using a lot of uh, hydrogen, uh, which is derived from fossil fuels. We call it grey hydrogen, and that has to be replaced by green hydrogen in order to get rid of the CO two emissions. So, furthermore,、uh, the the power. Uh, charging stations that you need for electric cars and buses and trucks、uh, could also be a challenge at many locations、uh, because there might be a lack of、uh, power transmission capacity. We see that that's some places in Europe. So if you have such challenges, then the solution is definitely green hydrogen-powered cars and buses and trucks instead of.、Uh, Electrical cars and buses and trucks. Would it mean that the power to X、uh, technology is an ideal solution when the green power cannot replace fossil fuels、uh, directly? So we do need power to X based on green fuels、uh, for large part of the transport sector, and for the processing and chemical industry, 
and by the way, also for the plastic industry, in order to get rid of uh, uh, those uh, CO2 em emissions coming from those sectors. Yeah, that was that. Thank you, uh, Kim. It's good to see you again online. Uh, we uh, continue uh, in the studio. Mentions uh, related to different energy systems. Uh, and I think it's interesting for us here to discuss uh, also that, like related to, uh, to floating winds. Um, in order to have these big structures, uh, 100 by 100 meter floaters, you need a lot of space. Um, Taiwan is, is not known for its space. Uh, what are your ideas? How can Taiwan facilitate this? Well, I think, uh, first of all, we need a proper checkup on our infrastructure readiness. And uh, like Anouk just said, it requires a lot of space, but also height, because you uh, most likely will mount the turbine together with the floater and then you drag it out. This is one of the one of the way. But in terms of turbine itself, we're all, we're, I think, pretty much talking and looking into the next generations of machines. So it's easily 14, 15 megawatts. Mm -hmm. So, so then all together, are we hitting any aviation restriction? That is something that again, requires uh, regulatory regimes support. And also when it comes to the harbor, the infrastructure of the harbor, it takes a real deep water harbor to be able to uh, to support the low out of, of the floater and the turbine. So so, so this is something that, uh, that requires a serious and in-depth checkup uh, for Taiwan. Yeah, the infrastructure is... Uh it's critical. Critical. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I mean, we have been quite fixated in uh, steel structure, but for floating wind, there's also an element of of uh, cement. So the whole supply chain can be developed. Of course, uh, this is also another difficulty. This is a raw, brand new. It's emerging technology. Everyone is there's so many design at the moment. So to be able to zoom into a certain design takes time. Of course, uh, the supply chain will also take time to develop. So the, the whole supply chain is also an element that. We should consider, and uh, if if uh, there's certain strength in 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 in, in, cert, uh, in, in, in the region, then we should focus on, uh, for example, uh, importing certain stuff from from the region or in, from Europe or from America. So uh, so if we just want to make floating wind or offshore wind a success, uh, we should open up ourselves to to uh, to to look into different technology, different supply chain as well. Yeah. Because at this point, indeed, I, what I understood is indeed there are different different options, right, related to floating, like related to bottom fixed. There's the monopile, which is uh, sort of like the one way to go uh, for floating winds. It's it's more diverse. Uh, do you already have ideas uh, where it will go, and, and what would be maybe the most interesting for for Taiwan is that you mentioned earlier uh, semi submersible. Do you feel that's that's uh, going to be the the, the uh, way forward for floating here? Yes. When we started the Kincardine project, we were faced with several problems, which eventually ended with us having to pay more than was required. Mm. And that main reason is exactly what Eldin was saying, is that you have to be able to build these things near the site that you're finally deploying it, not to, be, not to build it somewhere at a distance, and then you have to drag it all the way down and do the second mounting of the turbines, and then drag it all the way down again. So if you could do all of this near the site, that would be the best solution. Mm. But in fact, it's very hard to do that. So that's a, a, a problem that every developer would have to face. Uh, but there is a solution. Okay. Now, when, when you ask about the submersible floaters, the buoyancy chamber are very unique. If you don't have the turbine installed on it, you can do the minimum buoyancy requirement. So you don't have to fill it all up. And it's very easy to move around. That's where the installation of the turbine is done at the last stage, where you don't need to tow it that far. So that's that's an idea of how, how we envision mm. how it's going to work in Taiwan. Uh, the other thing is that the assembly, the assembly has to be done uh, efficiently together, such as in a production line. You do not assemble parts and then wait for other parts to come in. You actually have all the parts already, and like a production run, it just goes through a flow mm. so that you could do all of it and then have a storage for it. And then once the storage area is almost 
filled up, we would have to already construct the, the submersible and, and pull it out already. So that's the actual production line flow. It's not just developing it one at a time and then finishing it off. No, you, you develop as much as you can, but then you sort it out together to build the things you need immediately. Mm. That's the idea. That's right. It's all in the process. Yeah. Do we have uh, any other ideas about the release? I mean, there's three main types of uh, floaters in uh, currently floating. Uh, one is the uh, submersible type that uh, Rigi mentioned. The other one is the uh, um, spa type, which yeah. for the deeper waters. So there's one technology that came up in the news recently, is the Petra Spa. So it's something uh, um, developing technology. And another one that is uh, cement, is a damping pool uh, concept as well. So so these are the three main concepts. And of course, uh, it is applicable to the site. So for example, different site has different requirements for the beach. So I don't think any design is suitable for every uh, other countries in the world. But of course, we need to determine first which one makes the most sense for Taiwan, number one. And, and then, of course, with the corresponding supply chain, with the corresponding uh, uh, cost or ease of construction and installation, that, that will also matter which concept Taiwan choose. And, uh, so, and of course, based on that, we should uh, the Taiwanese government can also look into how we can structure the supply chain to focus on what is important for for Taiwan to, to be successful going forward. Yes, I would like to echo this uh, by, by promoting the idea, referencing on the success of the existing offshore wind regime. The Taiwanese government started with a pilot with an incentivized pilot project and then go into so-called potential site and into now uh, so-called zonal development. So they are stepwise development and, and that has shown great success. So can the Taiwanese government not also provide an incentivized demo project uh, scheme that allows, for example, a few 100 megawatt pilot floating projects where we the developers could team up with very strong contractors and to pioneer contractors internationally and uh, locally to pioneer what is the most suitable floating solution for Taiwan and uh, with some government uh, incentive for example a grant on your capex uh, for example, a proper feed-in tariff support on such brand new technology to enable Taiwan to have a smooth and successful first step. That is something that, uh, as developer, we would like to advocate. Yeah. Well, that's that's something. Maybe uh, an another question I had. I I think currently uh, following the the efforts being done here in Taiwan on offshore wind. Now, Taiwan is booming, uh, right? I think a lot of people are active here and a lot of things are happening. So related to floating, how do you see that floating offshore wind developments in Taiwan within its global perspective? Can it be an example indeed again? Uh, Elvin, do, do you have any? Uh... Sure. I mean, uh, right now, all the countries in the world are looking at demonstration. There are, there's really like 10, 15 demonstrations in, in the world or even more. But uh, going forward, it will be the pre-commercial in France, in Scotland, in Ireland. Um, so we need time to transit into a commercial phase. And, and there's a lot of challenges to be solved. And uh, of course, uh, what I'm trying to uh, say here is that we need the, 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 the right people, the right uh, resources, the right companies to be able to contribute to the success and uh, to anticipate, to address the problems, the challenges uh, for the projects moving forward. And I, I do think that Taiwan has the right uh, condition, the, the right uh, uh, regulatory framework, the stable economy, the, uh, the, the vast green resource, and also the, the, the applicable supply chain as well. And, and, and from what I see uh, from six years ago, when the Taiwanese government is very quick, very nimble in making this policy changes to make it happen. So I, I totally echo what Marina say as well. Without support from the government, without support from the policymaker, uh, it will be very hard to, to move floating wind forward. Mm. So there's a lot of pressure uh, developers has, contractors has. We need the government to push it to help us uh, uh, make Taiwan 
to be the continue to be the pioneering offshore wind region or countries in the world. Yeah, great. Homa, yeah. do you have anything uh, to to add here? Yeah. Echo your opinion. I think the most successful business is the business that the government wanted to succeed, yes. right? <laughs> and I, I'm just wondering, will the wind power industry, offshore wind power industry, one day become the national part of Taiwan? Maybe that's what we will see from now. Um, because uh, I think the fixed button the offshore wind technology, we have already like uh, 15 years late than mm. Europe, I think. But the Offshore wing, the floating offshore wing is just emerging right now. If we can catch up with the steps, we can be the first mover. We can have the advantage. So it's just the time right now. So if we, if we just step a little bit forward faster, then maybe we can catch up the, with the global trend. Then maybe just one day, yeah, they will become the new and very promising industry in Taiwan. And that's hope that one day will come. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, maybe I can compare it a bit because in the Netherlands, like I, as I mentioned, I'm from the Netherlands. We uh, we actually have maybe shallow waters around uh, our country. Uh, that's that's different here in Taiwan, and that makes it also interesting indeed to to specifically look into floating. Um, I mentioned there are quite some Dutch companies like Poscalis is here, but there are many others who do see there is so much like potential and I mean business uh, and uh, energy. So. When we are looking at Taiwan, uh, now there's a few uh, projects, of course, going on, uh, offshore wind. Uh, where do you feel floating wind is possible? Like it will be deep waters. Um, are there already developments in where to select these uh, locations? Or do you have ideas following your, what your company is looking at? Or, okay. uh, as Bridget, do you have any ideas about uh, um, Actually, the island is uh, separated between the Taiwan Strait, which Taiwan Strait provides the best wind resource in Asia. If you go to the eastern side, that's where the, most of the typhoon comes around. Mm -hmm. So nobody wanted to go there. And for logical reason, because it's very hazardous to be. Uh, also, you have more prehistoric uh, rocks in that area, rather than in the Taiwan Strait, where it's always moving. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, when you have a prehistoric seabed, there's a, always the danger of liquefaction, wherein the seabed is actually moving with it. So that's totally di difficult for floating solution because floating depends very much on mooring system. If the mooring system moves, then the whole floater moves away. So that's why we are more um, focused on the western side of the island. And that's what I think floating should be in. The other side is more dangerous. Yeah, and also because the wind, like uh, I always learn, like in the wind, in the winter, the wind is going from uh, north to south, and the uh, summer the other way. There is yes. always wind supply. Yes. yes. Do Do you have any other ideas of indeed location wise? What's uh, what would be the, the the things to to think of related to floating? Yes. Fission, uh, sufficient water de depth is uh, definitely a very important uh, element. And uh, for us, we are planning outside of Xinzhu and Miaoli counties because of the water depths. And uh, if we are starting with a small scale pilot, maybe it doesn't have to be that deep, meaning maybe a 40 to 50 meters will be okay, but ideally above 85, 80 to 85 and above meters deep will be a good uh, uh, area for floating solution. So, so that's why for our company, we have a pipeline of, of up to 3.3 gigawatt of floating offshore wind outside of Xinzhu and Miaoli. Mm -hmm. Interesting. We don't develop <laughs> offshore wind yeah. farms, so we can collaborate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe that's something uh, also yeah. interesting because uh, I, I have the idea. Uh, I believe your companies are also working together. Um, it's it's an industry that that needs a lot of collaboration, um, a collaboration from abroad, but also collaboration here. Uh, how how is this uh, collaboration going? You uh, like maybe you can reflect a bit on that. Uh, well, well, Boscalis helped us a lot with the King Harden project. So they're very, very good. <laughs> Actually, Gustavus and us, we are working in Denmark for a pioneering energy island. So they are the main 
contractor for our energy island solution. And that's also a brand new solution such as PTX, such as uh, floating that uh, we are pioneering. So, so, and of course, we're working together in our Zhangfang Xidao project very well and successfully installing a few foundations already. Lots of work going on next year for them. So, yeah. Glad that uh, Pascalis is able, Bo Wei Pascalis is able to contribute to the success of a uh, Taiwan offshore wind farm and also going forward floating. Yeah. Do you have any questions uh, for each other? Things that you feel like, hey, this is something that uh, should definitely be mentioned also today during the first episode of this uh, mini series. I think for I have questions for <laughs> He Mao because uh, as journalists, yes. uh, as media, uh, how do you see uh, how how are you going to promote offshore wind and uh, promote floating solution in twenty twenty two? Yes, I think uh, that's really a good question. That's yeah, so also a question for you <laughs> too. I think because uh, we need your cooperation. Uh, I can see that actually we have a cover story like in. 2019 uh, about uh, the the offshore wing already, but uh, at that time that the the readers' reactions are mm, were a bit cold. I must admit mm. that because at that time that the, this is although 2019 is we call the first year of offshore wing in Taiwan, but well, uh, reader will feel that it's just a promotion by the government mm. that we don't really feel it relevant. We don't relate it to the, the wind power. But gradually, we have started our project in ESG. And now this year, we have devoted a lot of energy on this uh, decarbonization project. And uh, we have already feel that the readers' reactions are different now. Mm -hmm. They are very keen about knowing what is RE100 and where to buy the green energies. And these are the reaction we have received recently. So I think... Uh, if you want to say something that you still need to attract people's attention, but when they were already curious about this, that is the most effective time to promote. Mm -hmm. So I think for the next uh, year, especially, or uh, the green energy demand will be really huge. So we will also focus more report on this green energy, where to obtain those renewables, and what the obstacles and where to buy. I think that's the where to buy is the, the question that, that most uh, our readers are really care about to know. Yeah. A lot of time, um, mm. I realize the industry talk to the industry a lot. I think we need the help of Business Weekly <laughs> to reach out to the corporate PPA, to the people who need to buy corporate energy, uh, green energy mm. and uh, help us reach out to more people that we don't usually do in our area of uh, influence. So that's why uh, it's very important. We need more yeah. mini-series going forward as well <laughs> to, uh, to let more people know about our, 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 what we do and uh, how we can contribute to the better for the environment. Yeah, and I think in the, in the beginning, you mentioned indeed uh, TSMC being the, the main uh, user or like requester for, for green energy. And what you want is, I think, all the big players like requesting green energy uh, to uh, to also push it push it further. But yeah, of course, a barrier from the regulations that it's not very easy to buy green energy directly. So, but um, the I think the more barrier is that people do not have the knowledge, and the, all this information are scattered around. So it's not focused. So we our responsibility or our job is to collect them all together and make it more interesting. And that's accessible. Yeah. Yes. And towards companies, but also towards uh, like the general public. Yes, of course, the general public. Only when the general public feel they, they have the need to know that the company and the brands will follow. And do that's you have the, uh, sorry to, uh, to continue. <laughs> <laughs> do you have the idea that, that the general public already knows about floating? Or is it uh, like to hmm. totally off topic? Yeah. I, I must say that it's a little bit far away from that. that now we may probably focus on the renewable first, yeah. the green energy, where to buy them. And then we realize that wind power is actually one of the options and very good promising option. And then you go to the offshore wind and then the floating wind, I think. Yeah, they are step by step. But um, there's also possibility because we see that the offshore, uh, the floating option is actually very great for Taiwan, the, the environment Taiwan. So maybe uh, if we 
get to know green energy more than you were the first. The first turn think of would be the floating wing. I think that might be the best scenario, scenario that we will have. Yes. And what would be uh, information uh, that you feel is it would be relevant related to uh, media that uh, the experts here can uh, can provide you with? Um, I think uh, we try to make it more uh, story-like because mm -hmm. people are talking, you are very experts, so you talk about the techniques and the details of your profession, you know, uh, knowledge. But uh, I think the people, uh, already reader, general public, want to know something more human that they, they can relate it to. Uh, for example, I just received, uh, uh, someone gave me a, a beer and I was told that it was made by wind power. And I just feel, oh, feel the first time that I can, well, relate it to. <laughs> 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 oh, uh, start with the H. <laughs> oh, got it. Yeah, yeah, I think, no, 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 no. Okay. Yeah. Next, next time we will yeah, have yeah, we beers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see my eyes sparkle. Yeah. <laughs> you heard the combination of offshore wind and beer. That's uh, what's. <laughs> Yeah, so I think we will find more, or, or you can provide us these kind of materials. I think that's what, what really draws attention from the readers or the general public, yeah. to make them feel related to. Maybe uh, then I can ask the, the, the three experts here to give in, in one minute like your storyline uh, for, uh, for Halma, but also for, uh, for the studio in the end of this uh, first episode. Reggie, can I uh, start asking uh, with you? I think that uh, it's a general view for all of us that uh, Taiwan has some of the best naval engineers. And they just needed to be given that opportunity to show it out. And we're, we're going to be one of those companies who would want to let them have that uh, arena to, to play out. Great. So I think that's the, the one thing that all developers would be able to do. Great. To bring this thing inert in Taiwan to make it active. Great. Marina, your, uh, your view. Yes, together we can. Together we can. And CIP is here to co-create and collaborate with Taiwan, with the Taiwanese industries, with the Taiwanese academia, and of course the Taiwanese government to make all of this possible. Thank you. Elvin. Pascales Poway has been very much into people these days. So for example, this year we had our cadetship program. And next year, we're looking into international traineeship program to, and uh, because we realize, especially during COVID times, getting people from abroad is so difficult. So it's better off we groom our own people, we, grow, we groom the Taiwanese people to be able to take out this job so that they can uh, export themselves out of the country, not just the supply chain, but also the people. I think that's something that uh, I would like to uh, paint it towards the magazines uh, that uh, we, we value talents and we want to. Uh, grow that and uh, so that this uh, Taiwanese offshore wind is a sustainable uh, development. Yeah, not just developers coming in or contractors coming coming in and then they leave after the project ends. Well, thank you, Th thank you, everyone. Uh, it's uh, it's been great to actually discuss this with you. The buzz on offshore wind, uh, but specifically why floating winds. Um, in the next episodes. We will, uh, it will be moderated uh, by my colleague from the British office in Taipei, and it answers the question um, how floating winds can uh, benefit the industry chain. Uh, and the third episode, we will be the last one, we'll focus on what should be considered as next steps in order to make it happen uh, here in Taiwan. I wish all the viewers much knowledge gain and welcome everyone to reach out to the Nan's office Taipei, of course, if you're interested to collaborate. Um, thank you very much and thank you for all the speakers.